Exactly. You're more than comfortable to say ear, nose and mouth. So you should be yeah. comfortable to, to say vulva and labia and clitoris, et cetera. Yeah. And just like we, we know what works for us with regards to diet, with, with regards to exercise, with products to put in our faces. So we should be so in tune with what's happening with our, with our female genitalia and, you know, what works for us. You know, this lube is fantastic. This lube sucks for me. You know, this Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's podcast. My guest is Candace Jane Langford. Now, this is a very interesting podcast for me to do because it's dealing with words and things that have historically been taboo to speak about. But I have to say, Candace, through her Instagram account, has kind of opened my eyes and I started following and I thought I need to chat to her. Well, I want you to enjoy this because Candace is a physiotherapist specializing in the vulva and womanhood. So very interesting ch uh, chat I had to her. So with no further ado, please enjoy my podcast with Candace. Hello. How's it? How are you? I'm not bad on you. Good. Okay. So this thing's sound is working. It's working okay. perfectly. I can hear you fine. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Are awesome. you on, on, on your bed? I am. <laughs> <laughs> I had to find the. We don't have a desk upstairs, so just I've I've got like my vacuum cleaner box <laughs> and then a tray. I had to try and find it. Had to be eye level. I've really, gotten very creative here because otherwise awesome. Richard's going to arrive home and barge in. And that's fine. Good. That's a, that. But that's the beauty about my podcast. It's it's just we just flow <laughs> with it. I'm actually I've got my computer on a cake tin. <laughs> is it <laughs> gotta get creative <laughs> cool man cool well Aww. listen thanks thanks for chatting it's, so yeah, so to be honest with you i like I've, this is my 13th podcast and <laughs> i do not get nervous i of course it's just talking right we just we just talk yeah. but i've actually got a bit of a butterfly because i've got <laughs> you know it's, i've got to use the right terminology because this is we're talking about women and women's parts so yeah. All of a sudden, this afternoon, I thought to myself, you don't want to say the wrong things, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> Better start Googling. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, but then I thought to myself, well, you know what? This is actually then a good thing for, for all guys because if I feel like I'm uncomfortable with terminology or the knowledge of womanhood, Right. Then maybe there's other people, guys as well. So, and, and again, that's why I said the other day, what are we going to talk about? Well, let's just talk. And whatever I don't know, I'm going to ask. And yeah. I'm sure if some guys listen to this, they're going to go, oh, well, actually, I didn't know that as well, you know? So yeah. where you normally, I would imagine, um, you train women and help women to understand women. This could be that as well as helping a few guys to understand women. If yeah. No. Yeah, definitely. You know what? I, this is the reason why I started the Instagram page because um, I realized that women and men don't know about female anatomy. And the same applies to male anatomy and, and hormones and life stages in, in the male body. But I think just because uh, the female changes and the stages that women go through are a lot more out there, they are, they, they're very taboo. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is why I think people don't really know their own anatomy. They don't understand what is going on in their bodies. And yeah, it's, it's women and men. And that's why I created this platform. Why do you and think men. that is though, Candice? I mean, like, as you talk, I'm thinking it's, it's a body part, like a nose mm. or a tongue or a, it, it is just a body part. Exactly. Why in society did it become this taboo to this extent that, People don't even explore and know their own body. Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of people like to say, and I think it does play a huge role in, in what's happening right now, it's, it's patriarchy. It's the way we've been brought up. You know, it's, for example, it was only in the 70s where women were included in scientific research you know, when they were kind of testing our drugs that we would take, that we would take, we always tested on men and women were seen, there's a physio in, in Canada. She says, you know, women aren't small men. You can't just do a copy paste as to whatever happens in men. Okay. We'll just do minimize it and say that's what happens in women. So it, it's really, it's so ingrained in, in everything so much so that I don't think we even realize it. You know, 
so there, there, there's different concepts in, in our lives you know the, the fact that the let me how can I relate this so for example virginity virginity is only really ever related to to women not really thought of as as a male concept you know sure. but what on earth is virginity and what is why is there something for women to lose and there's not something for men to lose it's just this kind of imbalance in male female um yeah. that has that has resulted in women's health concerns being kind of brushed under the rug ignored not um explored you know young girls and women are kind of short told shut your legs, don't talk about it. If there's anything wrong, you know, it's shameful. Don't explore yourself. Whereas little boys, you know, they have their first wet dream or they jerk off for the first time and everyone's like, yeah, you're fulfilling your manhood. You go, mm. boy. But if a girl were to uh, be seen or heard conversing around about her vulva, she, everyone would kind of think, oh, you, she's slutty. You know, what is she getting into? She's going to fall pregnant when she's young. You know, those types of things. So it over time it's just become something that you don't talk about that you hide away from that you shy away from that you you know just don't don't even go there because you actually don't know what the outcome is and you're most likely going to be judged or stigmatized against does that really answer your mm. question no absolutely yeah. i mean you've said so many things now that actually was that's <laughs> are you that's unbelievable that I, that only in the 70s we started well, doing you don't don't quote me on that, but it's something around there. It's not oh, very long 60s ago. Or, it still doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. or 50s, that's, only, that's the other day. If you think of how long we've been around as a species, I mean, that's incredible. Mm. Yeah, man. Yeah. Also, I think, and definitely me, until a few years ago, <clears throat> I've always thought about life as what we can see on photos and videos. So you mm. look back at, at, at the Second, Third World War. That's me now. I've always had the idea of that is so long ago. Now that I understand a little bit more about where we come from, evolution, etc., that's the other day. That's the other yeah. day. There's, and there's yeah. so much happened in, in everything in life now. But in the last hundred years, the, the way everything just escalated and then still yet let's call it the fifties to be safe. Only then they started uh, yeah. doing a test, medical tests where they include women. That is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I know it is. It's, it's absolutely mind blowing. And it just, that, that concept and that, that way of life has just really followed through. And it's just, it just stuck with us. You know, women are still prescribed the contraceptive pill um, to normalize periods. And that just couldn't be further from the truth. It's not going to normalize your period. It puts your period on pause. So if you're having issues now and you start taking the contraceptive pill to normalize your period, chances are you're going to be 28 going on 30, 32, thinking about having kids. And you say, okay, let me stop my pill now so that I can go, that I can fall pregnant. Please explain that you to me. Norm go Sorry, I don't understand. Normalize your period means what? Okay, so, so oftentimes, okay, you might be and you're 14, 15, 16, and you, you're getting your period for the first time. So your period should come, you know, every 25 to 35 days, and you should, you should bleed for five to seven days, right? Um, but when we're younger, we might experience irregular periods. They may come too, too frequently, or they may take too long, or they may be really heavy or uncomfortable and cause a lot of pain, right? So then a young girl would go to a, a medical professional and say, this is my issue. Um, and, and the conversations that should be had is, okay, why, what is it that's causing that? And instead from the fifties where, where the contraceptive pill came around, um, it's just been prescribed to say, okay, take this pill. It will normalize your period. It'll make your hormones normal. And then, um, when you want to have a child, you stop it and then you'll kind of, you'll be ready to conceive. The problem is, is that the contraceptive pill is just that. It's a really good contraceptive. It stops you from falling pregnant. But it's not positively influencing your, your menstrual cycle. Mm. It's, um, it, you don't ovulate when you're on it. And, and women rely on ovulation. Ovulation is the only way we produce a hormone called progesterone. Um, so, so when you're on it, you don't ovulate. And what happens is that women are, are having this dysfunction when they're young. They go on the pill, the pill puts them on pause, and then now they come 29, 30, and they stop the pill. 
it's just put you on pause. So you've gone way back to what you, what your experience was when you were about 16 years old. And let's say you actually had a dysfunction there. You had endometriosis or it was polycystic ovarian syndrome, or, you know, there was something out untoward that, it, that was affecting your menstrual cycle. Now, all of a sudden you're 20, now 30, you've stopped it and you've gone straight back into that. And that, so it's not the pull that's making people infertile, that's, that, that's a fear. It's just that you've gone straight back to that scenario. And now you're 29, 13, you think, oh, okay, I really have to rush to have a child now, you know? So, and your period may take 18 months to come back from then. But now you feel pressured to have a child. And that's when women kind of feel as though, okay, the pill has now made me infertile. Okay, now I need to go to IVF. I need to go to artificial insemination. I need to go on other synthetic hormones to, to get me there. So it's just this it's we've been bought the, the, this this concept and this this lack of education in and around women's health and and what's going on in our medication and um our hormones has has resulted in us kind of i don't want to say being lied to but i do kind of feel like we're being lied to and it's 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 the lack of education in in our professionals and it's that backward way of thinking you know we've we're still stuck in you know, in the fifties up to the seventies was when the main, the, the contraceptive pool like really was changing a lot. Mm. And, uh, that w it just hasn't been explored since then almost. Mm. And now, however many years later, women are still being prescribed this pill to normalize the period, which is what we thought it was doing back in the day. Yes, it's a contraceptive. Fantastic. If you want to take it for that, take it for that, but don't take it to do things that it's not doing uh, as oh. a normalize your so, period. So as a contraceptive yeah. If yeah that, you, that works you're saying and yeah. and okay that's you you that may be a good thing to do or do you or are there other things that girls can do oh yeah to, yeah what well, are just what, yeah so so, so so this is a little example as to why you kind of wouldn't want to take the contraceptive pill um for contraceptive if there are other options out there so there has been a pill that was developed for men instead of women, so that we don't have to put chemicals into our bodies every single day. But men, so they did the study and it was rejected. It ended up being rejected because men were having mood swings. Um, they were having suicidal thoughts. They were gaining weight, all these things. But this is, these are the exact experiences that women are experiencing. Women, yeah. they, they, there's, there's so there, there are so many records of women feeling depressed and going on to anti antidepressants, um, having suicidal thoughts. You know, they they're not um, able to perform in sports. So many different things as to what the contraceptive pill does to you. But then when when they tried to say, okay, let's reverse it, let's give it to men, it was literally I think it was one study, one one clinical trial, and they just said, oh, scrap it. We can't have our men being moody. Um, so it was it was kind of chucked out. So yes, you can take it as a contraceptive pill, but it's not. I mean, it's a chemical that you're putting in your body every single day. And, and the more informed we are about that, women are less likely going to want to take it for those reasons. So there's very many other options. You know, there's um, condoms, there's a barrier method. There are uh, intrauterine devices, which is like a little, it's like a T-shaped device that's uh, probably like two centimeters long that would go into your uterus and that can stop you from falling pregnant. Um, there's fertility awareness method where a woman kind of monitors, okay, where am I in my menstrual cycle? Am I ovulating? If I'm ovulating and I want to fall pregnant, then great, let's have sex then. If I am ovulating and I don't want to fall pregnant, okay, let's use the barrier method or avoid um, sex during this period of time because you can't, you, you typically can't fall pregnant at any time you you're only kind of supposed to fall pregnant during your ovulation period mm. yeah during that, that mm. short that short phase so yeah there's other options um many people do use the contraceptive pill still but it's it's really not the greatest thing you don't want to put unnecessary chemicals that are really altering your life experience and the way your body is made to function mm. what by do taking you think, a pill every day what do you think uh, i mean I from what I understand, and, and as I'm listening to people around me, it, it does look like it is a bit harder to fall pregnant these days for couples. Um, now, I don't know. This is me listening to people. I don't know whether there's any fact behind the mm. statement. Um, but just yeah. listening to people around me, it does look like it, it's harder. Is, do you think that's got anything to do with the fact that 
Look, I think as many things, we live in a stressful life and we eat food yeah. that are not always um, clean of chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But do you think the pill yeah. also has got a big thing to do with it? Well, uh, yeah, it's definitely many of those lifestyle factors that are going to contribute to it. The pill, I would say the fact that you potentially had a polycystic ovarian syndrome, for example, as a, as a condition when you were younger, that wasn't explored. So instead of saying, okay, let's rectify your, your insulin levels, let's rectify your diet, let's introduce exercise, let's really figure out why your body isn't functioning and your menstrual cycle isn't functioning as normal when you are for 15 to 16. Um, instead of that happening, you put on the pill, you put on pause. So then you no longer have any symptoms. You don't have those heavy periods. You don't have the discomfort. You don't have all those, the, the acne, et cetera, from polycystic. And then now all of a sudden you're 29 and you are taken off of the pill, um, but you're back in that polycystic state. So now it's not the pill itself. The pill just puts you on pause. It's that you've got this condition that was never dealt with back in the day that now all of a sudden at 29, 30, you've got this and, and very many people have polycystic um, and because they've got that now they are struggling to conceive. So mm. I wouldn't say it's the, the pill I, from, from what I read, it's not the pill causing it. You can get post pull polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is just your body kind of adapting to uh, coming off of the pill and coming off of that reliance of those chemicals right. that you've been taking on a daily basis. Um, so that's just an adaptation process, but it's also the fact that, you know, it's, you, you throw him back into that, that polycystic that you had back when you were younger and it's, you don't, you feel as though you don't have the time to, to wait it out, to resolve those symptoms, to, to get you to ovulate well in order to conceive. Right. So it's things like that. But then also I would say it's also because, you know, we are, we are kind of blooming, let's say later in our lives, you know, if you think about your parents and your parents' parents, you know, they were 21, they were 22, they were 26, and they had their families like all set up. And now, you know, I've had patients that are 42 and 44 that are pregnant and having their first child. So we are conceiving a lot later. And that, that is a, when we are likely to be in our perimenopausal life stage, which means that you are ovulating a lot less and it is going to be more difficult to conceive. Mm. Yeah. Tell me you this. Can, you, yeah. So I was actually talking to Nick yesterday um, yeah. and, and your sister-in-law and we were discussing a few things and one of the things that came up and we were just saying, what do you think happened 200 years ago when there were no uh, hospitals around and um, no doctors um, and at, the, at those days women had up to 10 or 15 children you know, before they were 40 years old. Yeah. I mean, that must have been, how did <laughs> women survive? Because they didn't have all this knowledge that we have right now. Yeah. Well, I think it was simpler times in an essence. Like, for example, so they did have help. So there was, there was often a, a village doula, you know, someone in the village that was considered like the older and the knowledgeable. And she was always present during the pregnancies and during the births and always had those conversations. So she was very skilled um, in, in delivery and the process and what to look out for. So there was always that person kind of present um, and guarding women through pregnancy and, and delivery. And then, um, for example, women were more likely, they weren't, they weren't going to have epidurals which kind of numb you from the waist down. Um, they were more like, and you, and you don't lie on your back with your legs up in stirrups in order to deliver your baby. Um, you are in a squatting position, you're in your all fours, you're a lot more mobile. And in those positions, it is a, it's a bit easier to deliver a baby. So if you imagine lying on your back with your knees up, your coccyx and your sacrum, kind of, it's like, it's like a half bowl at the bottom, right? And I, yeah. I hope this yeah, makes yeah. sense over audio. So when the baby is coming out, it has to go down into that bowl and then up the other side. So it's a lot more difficult for a baby to kind of, kind of swim uphill um, in order to, uh, <laughs> to, to complete the delivery. So why don't we still, right? why don't we do it the same? 
So yeah. there are very many women that still deliver at home. They do water births. They, they choose not to um, take epi, um, use epidural, for example. And those women are likely to squat or be on the all fours. But, but it's, it's a lot less common. I think, you know, cesarean section rates in the Western Cape, I think, where they were like 90% the last time I checked. Um, but then the women that are undergoing natural delivery are often, um, the one, are often having an... Uh, uh, an epidural and when you have an epidural you you are numb you can't be on your knees you can't be walking around you can't be in a squatting position so then those women are sitting and, squ and pushing 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 to get their baby out um whereas back in the day you would breathe your baby out you would kind of you know you know breathe with it kind of feel the contractions move with it and it was a a, a much more gentle process whereas now um it is coming back and and there are very many doulas and they are um guides that kind of are, are trying to encourage women to to embrace this older method of delivery um yeah. Would you, what, what, so, what is what is your view on it if what, or, or can i ask you what if you yeah. could choose what would you do so so i mean if i have if and when i fall pregnant and, yeah. and i'm having a child i would love to I would love to have natural birth, right? Without an epidural or with just a very mild painkiller of some sort. And I would want to be guided through my pregnancy and, and through that delivery process where um, I've, got, I've got someone giving me feedback, you know, this is what's happening in your body. This is what it means. Because a lot of the time, there's a lot of fear. You know, women are lying down. They can't see what's happening. They've got a doctor screaming at them saying, push, 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 you know, and it's, it, it, it's, it, it, it entices, I mean, it elicits fear. And then that woman is, is going to, instead of relaxing their pelvic floor, relaxing their hips, you can imagine if you're tensing up, you're kind of closing off that entire environment where the baby's trying to come out. And then you are now pushing against that because the doctor's telling you to push. Whereas there's this, I don't want to say new way of thinking, but this revolution. Modern, modern, thinking. modern, modern. Yeah. I wouldn't say modern because it's it's from back in the day. It's just kind of being brought back right. um, it, of, of breathing your baby out and being relaxed and being one with the, the whole experience. So that would be a priority for me. But at the end of the day, mom's health, baby's health comes first. And if I have to have a cesarean to save my life or save my baby's life, we can't be against it. We have to be, we have to be open to these things. And, and I, yeah, I think it's it, that in itself can be, can be the big problem is when a mom goes into well, a, a mom to be goes into this process very fixated on I have to have natural childhood I have to and if I don't um, there's something wrong with me because then you come out the other side and you feel traumatized by the experience oh I had to have a cesarean that's not what I wanted you know you focus and you, you shift your focus on the wrong things and that's where good guidance comes from. And that's why I think it's so valuable to have a midwife, have a doula guiding you through these things, making you very aware of the potential outcomes and what that means and that it's not something to, to be ashamed of. Or, um, and if there is trauma postpartum, that it's something that needs to be dealt with straight away. Mm. Yeah. What, what so is, a doula, is a doula? What, what is it, did you say doula? Yes. So, so they, they pretty much guide you through through the whole process they prepare you they teach you things like your uh perennial massage which is where you are going to massage and try and stretch out the perineum to prepare you for for delivery they teach you about breathing techniques that you'll use during your your delivery process they they are there with you kind of massaging your back making sure that you're breathing well helping you through different positions, bringing you water, really like just being there in every part of, and, and, and kind of with the experience, with the experience so that you can trust them. You know, it's very well having your husband there, but he may pass out because he, or your partner, whoever may be, he may pass out out of fear, you know, and not be able to rub your back to help you through that contraction. You need someone that really has, has good insight and has your best yeah. interest in heart. So if you, you might've said to that person, this is how I foresee my, my delivery process happening. And this is how I would love it, to, love it to kind of pan out. And that person tries to ensure that, that it comes out that way and that it, that it follows what, what you intend. Mm. So long as you're both safe though. <laughs> Did you watch um, this program called Goop on Netflix? I, I haven't watched it all. I've watched one of them, the one about pleasure. And I was very impressed. 
Was Did very, you not watch the one with, uh, with the lady that speak about the vulva? Uh, where they showed all the different pictures? They, were, they had a lady oh, there, oh, that, an older lady, that basically, um, in a sense, do similar stuff to you where she was talking about women are very uh, shy and uh, self aware of their um, female parts and this is where I, for the first time I've learned that it's actually not called a vagina it's called a vulva it's called a vulva yes, a vagina yes. So is, I think that's the third episode I've watched it yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. am I right by saying the vagina is actually the internal bit yes that's the canal that the baby kind of comes through and then they come out of the vulva right and then the vulva yeah. is everything uh, inside and outside and um, oh. Uh, can I say your lips and, 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 yes. and your clitoris and everything Labia. together? So yes. that was the first yes. time I've learned that word. But <laughs> that that program for me was was really interesting. Um, yeah. The, from what I've learned there is that not all women are comfortable or at ease with the female parts. Um, mm. It made me ask the question, I wonder if guys are, are there some guys that feel the same? I, I, that I don't know, but that was, that was a very interesting program about that. Yeah. No, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And I, I was so happy when I saw that program come out, um, when, I, when I watched that episode, because the majority of the women that come come to me so when i treat pelvic floor i do like an internal vaginal exam so it's like a gynae exam Wait, so it's and, a pelvic floor explain to me pelvic floor okay so so your pelvic floor is a bowl of muscles at the base of your pelvis right and it kind of slings and it looks like a, a hammock from your two sit bones to your pubic symphysis at the front to your coccyx at the back and it's got a few holes in it and those holes in, in a woman there's three so it's your vagina your urethra and your anus um for people who pleasure pain and then in men we've just got two which is anus and the urethra and the your your pelvic floor being muscle contracts to either close those those um, those holes and and lift up to support your pelvic organs or that it relaxes completely and when it relaxes it's allowing passage of urine allowing passage of a stool and allowing penetration of a penis but whereas so so, the, so dysfunction comes where this muscle is not really working very well or working how we would expect it to. So it's there. So the pelvic floor, when it's, when it's strong and it, when it's working well, it's, it functions to support the lumbar pelvic region. So, so in and around your pelvis, creating like a stable base, which is going to facilitate, you know, function during sports, hip injuries, knee injuries, ankle injuries. It, it, it's just a stable base, a stable foundation. Um, and then it also functions to maintain continence, so keep everything inside, so pee and poo, um, until appropriate to let go. Uh, and then it also functions to relax and allow passage of urine, passage of feces. And when it relaxes, you're also allowing for penetration during intercourse because it's going to allow those, those openings to, to widen and soften. Um, it also functions to support your pelvic organs, um, which is your, your bladder, your bowel, and your uterus in a woman. So yeah. it's kind of holding them in place. And then it also has a function in sex, which I've kind of mentioned already. It's that ability to relax and let go and also having good blood supply for, for women to reach orgasm, etc. Yeah. So the pelvic floor is incredibly Very important. valuable. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's something that needs to be looked after. So just like you would how do you do that? How, your, do you, how do you look after that? How do you, what, what do you have to do to look after that? So, so number one would be your awareness, you know, knowing that it's there, knowing what it does, knowing these functions. So if there is some kind of dysfunction, instead of saying, oh, you know, I leak urine, you know, when I laugh, sneeze, cough, jump, you often hear women or you may, maybe men don't, I don't know. But if you're in a group of women um, and, they, and you're laughing, 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 they'll kind of say, don't make me laugh. You're going to make me wee my pants, you know, and you might have heard that. And it's so common that it's seen to be normal, but it's not normal. It's something that should be treated. So just like you might say, oh, I've got such a headache. I've got such a sore neck. What would you do? You go to physio, you get it sorted out. You'd strengthen certain muscles. You'd relax certain muscles to, to relieve you of your symptoms. Where, where, when it comes to the pelvic floor, we have so little awareness that when something is wrong, if you're constipated, if you have pain during sex, if you can't achieve any penetration, we don't 
we don't see it as something wrong. We, we, we see it as one of these taboo topics that we don't talk about and it's, it's, it's common. So, oh my gosh, is that make it normal? So I'm just not going to seek help. So I would say number one is, is your awareness. And then number two would be seeking help. Number three would be being aware of, of your hormonal fluctuations that are impacting your pelvic floor and your pelvic health. So women, for women, it's, it's incredibly valuable to, to track your menstrual cycle, know where you are in it or how that's going to impact your, your um, symptoms that you might be having. Um, and then doing exercise, just like you would exercise in your strength in your arms, your leg, your back, your neck. So we should also strengthen and incorporate our pelvic floor into our daily function. Um, yeah, yeah, I would say that those are really good points to, to kind of start so, with. <laughs> so does, in, I don't know, in school, does girls get taught important things about their womanhood or is there, uh, because I can just imagine that not a lot of mums know this so they especially they don't know it and some moms might be not comfortable to talk about it to their girls so i would imagine yeah. a lot of girls come through life not knowing these things um now yeah. obviously there are the people like yourself and other people that uh act, you know, active on teaching on social media etc but how, do, how does girls learn this how do they know this <laughs> so yeah we should we should learn it from from our parents we should learn it from school but it's actually only now 2020 the department of education is right now um initiating their very first comprehensive sex education program and it's being kind of followed through from grade one all the way through to matric and when they actually introduced this idea there was a whole uh, protest almost of parents saying no they don't want their children to learn these things in school because really? they're scared it's going to sexualize their children and i think it comes from a uh, from a standpoint of, of lack of education you know they actually the parents don't actually know what your children are going to be taught and they think it's going to be porn on tv at school or something you know and it's because our parents also don't know so essentially they need the same education which is where kind of why i started the instagram page um yeah, so, so our parents should be kind of introducing us to, okay, when you're around 13, you're most likely going to start your period. This is what it's going to be like. This is what you're going to use. And, you know, then you might start to feel an attraction to boys and you might feel this and you might feel that. And, you know, it's normal to explore your anatomy. And if you do explore your anatomy, this is what you might find. And, you know, if I'm always here for questions. You can come to me. You can talk to me. It's creating that open narrative and making sure that that the conversation can flow in a home environment. And that's something that it often often doesn't. So I, I did an, an Instagram kind of series about, about periods. And I had a whole bunch of women kind of telling me about their first period experiences. And I had a girl that didn't speak about, didn't tell her mom about her period for a full year. She, she stole tampons. She snuck pants out of her mom's stash. She stole from her sisters. She, you know, just so that she didn't have to talk about it because it's so terrifying because no one had ever spoken to her about it. Um, I did, there's very many stories of women thinking, well, young girls thinking they were dying because they'd never, ever heard that this is a thing. Yeah. It, it's, it's terrifying. Um, but the great thing is that the access to information is, is improving at, at an exponential scale at the moment, you know, on Netflix, we've got uh, six, six explained, which is a really good series. We've got sex education, which is um, uh, another series about a uh, sex counselor. And then we've got the group episodes that are coming up and you just got more and these books coming out of my ears about this stuff. Um, and these podcasts, there's just so much more information being made available. So the great thing is that we are in, I mean, and I think over the next 10 years, it's just going to completely shift and change. Schools are introducing it now. You know, it, it's everywhere. It's in our social media. Mm -hmm. So there is change and women should know these things, but it's only now that we're really getting introduced to these concepts and that mm -hmm. will follow through and change the way we treat and raise our children. So as yeah. you're talking, I'm just thinking that um, I would imagine most of your clients are people that are uh, lucky enough to uh, be in a certain income level to, un to have access to Netflix, to have access to a computer with uh, YouTube and so forth. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, I've actually heard about this before where 
we've got so many poorer people in the in this country that in talking about periods i've heard horror stories mm. about girls that don't they don't even have the means to buy sanitary pads or anything yeah. to, to yeah. help them so that that's that's tough eh? yeah so so lucky enough there are a few programs that are taking place in our more rural communities so there's uh, a company called subs and they have um, washable pads that they, they, they distribute in different schools. So you can kind of send them funds and it goes towards them doing this. And they go into the schools. And one of the reasons why I really, really like them is that they go in there and they educate these girls. girls. They take pictures, they take all sorts of devices, and they really show them and teach them what does it mean, what's happening in your body. So there are programs like this, but... Yeah, few and far between. There's not enough. Um, there's government clinics and government hospitals where there are pelvic floor physios practicing. I know in Tigerberg, uh, Lenise Jacobs is there. She she functions as a women's health physio there in, in the hospitals, and I think she's really really busy. Um, but that's not happening in every single hospital, and yeah. it just uh, it come it comes down to a political argument about the amount of money that's going into our educational system and into our healthcare system. So I think the help people are willing to do it, but when it's not coming from when there's no compensation coming from from the government, and, yeah, and then it yeah, sure. makes it that much that frustrating topic that we can't really do much about <laughs> besides vote. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. yeah. So if we stick to um, the subject of, of period a little bit, um, mm. help, help our guys, help, help the guys to, <laughs> to know what to do and what to say, because you've touched on it before that it, <laughs> unfortunately uh, it is a tough time for women when yeah. you, your period is coming up and you have got these chemical what shall I, I don't want to call it imbalances. <laughs> Chemical. No, it's hormonal changes. Hormonal changes. There you go. Yeah. Um, that, <laughs> that, it's, that, that, that it's hard to, at the time, know that you are not in a great mood and, and guys yeah. don't understand it because we don't experience that. What do we no, do? No, you don't. <laughs> Very many women will ask the same thing. What do we do? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so... So it comes first and foremost from the woman knowing where they are in their menstrual cycle. So if, if a woman starts to feel these, these emotions and these symptoms and she doesn't know that, that she's coming up to starting her period so she's the end of her luteal phase, then that just causes this kind of spiral effect because you, you might so, – so some of the symptoms are um, insomnia or, or difficulty sleeping, it's fatigue, it's irritability, it's depression, it's lack of motivation, it's – lack of energy, you know, you feel like you can't exercise, you can't think straight, you're foggy. So I mean, those are really big symptoms to be experiencing. So if a, if a woman doesn't know, okay, I'm in the end of my luteal phase, I'm starting to feel these symptoms. Um, so it's okay. I'm just going to be slow and be gentle with myself. I'm going to eat and nourish well, and I'm not going to do too much exercise. I'm just going to be gentle with myself. If you don't know that and you don't acknowledge it and, and, and react accordingly, then what ends up happening is that your, your mind's going racing like, oh my gosh, why am I feeling like this? Oh my word, I've been feeling like this for a while now. And you know, you spiral down and your emotions get worse and worse. And then you, you react to, to situations and scenarios um, inappropriately. And it becomes that much more difficult in, in a relationship, you know, to tolerate your partner. Because, you know, you just feel like, oh, I'm depressed and oh, I'm feeling, I'm feeling X, Y, and Z. And, you know, then your partner irritates you and you, you react um, disproportionately and if you don't realize that okay I mean I often have a conversation with my husband I'm like hey like just be nice to me and if I ask for love and if I ask for hugs you just give them to me because I need them now because this is where I am and <laughs> and he understands because I have that education yeah. so so I really think it's so valuable for women to, to educate themselves about their bodies and that's where it starts it starts with the woman knowing exactly what's going on in her body and having that open conversation with your partner whoever your partner may be um and being able to converse and saying, but that's also where taboo comes in. If I'm brought up in a culture where I'm not allowed to speak about my, my hormonal changes or my symptoms or my period, I, mean, I can't even say that word because it just 
just is overwhelming for me, then it's less likely I'm going to have that conversation with you. So mm-hmm. if, if your partner isn't going to have that conversation and kind of tell you where they are, um, it's about picking up on cues, you know, maybe keeping track in your own head. Okay. More or less it's been about 30 days, you know, 25 days or so partners periods probably coming um, and acknowledging that they probably fatigued, they're irritable, they, they, you know, want to eat all the time and that's driving them mad and it just being, being gentle with them with regards to those symptoms. So if you know that it is coming, just, yeah, if, if yeah. you acknowledge and, and. That is so important that push. you say there. That I think, I think that's, that's the key there. And just in my uh, past, I can almost say that every girlfriend that I've had came into the relationship saying that, no, you know what? I don't have um, any problems when before my period. I don't get um, cranky. And mm. it takes five, six months, then I realized they, were, they weren't truthful, right? So yeah. it's just, you're just normal. You're just like any other woman. These things yeah. happen to you. So, yeah. and again, that, that, actually, that actually proves what you just said. So um, rather say, yeah, no, listen, I, I'm, a, I'm a woman and it is tough for me in those times. I don't know mm. when things happen. Uh, yeah. Help me through it. Like literally, yeah. <laughs> there was a bit of a lie in the beginning, you know? So yeah, <laughs> it's rather just. Yeah, no. Yeah. And, and just, just also from, from a male standpoint, just being understand, understanding that yes. women do find it really difficult to speak about. You know, oftentimes, I mean, you might, you as a male might think that women, in their little closed groups discuss these things, but, but not always. Some women have never spoken to any other soul about these symptoms, about how they feel. And oftentimes they'll go to a doctor and they'll be expressing symptoms, but the doctor won't even ask them questions. So they have never conversed. This. So in such denial and they feel so shameful that they do get depressed. They feel so shameful that they do get moody and irritable and angry and frustrated with every single word that comes out of your mouth. That they they're too ashamed to admit it. So, mm. yeah, it's a difficult thing. But like like I said, it is changing. It really, really is changing. Mm. And women are becoming more proud of the fact that they have a menstrual cycle. And more. no, so I was just saying before, on that very same program, it was quite interesting for me to to learn that um, a lot of women aren't happy with the look of their vulvas, and that I reckon is due to the pornography um, industry um, because yeah. apparently a lot of the porn stars have um, their vulvas uh, fixed. And, and, and I, I, I can't remember the word, but I think it's like, there's a word for it. Um, uh, it's a labiaplasty. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Some fancy yeah. word. <laughs> so, and so and they make, bleaching. Yeah. They have the, um, <laughs> Valvas operated on so it looks a certain way that's yeah and so when women see that and they notice their own uh parts then they feel not worthy yeah yeah definitely we feel like something's wrong with us yeah. and it's so incredibly incredibly common and yeah so so it goes back to to education you know our for, for boys for young boys and for young women uh, for, for boys, let's, let's start there. Um, your main source of sex education comes from porn. So, why, so one, you, you think vulvas look a certain way. Two, there's no prioritizing foreplay because the female um, genitalia that elicits arousal is more external than internal. Um, Three, you prioritize it. You just think it's that kind of boom, bang, and you go, and, and the woman just screams and shouts, and, and great, cool, she's had a good time. There's no prioritizing female arousal and orgasm. It's all about the man. It's, it, and once again, it's that patriarchal way of thinking, and it's just it's so ingrained, even in porn. Um, and then women are, it's, it's taboo to watch porn, so you, know, you don't you dare, so you don't even, you're not even going to learn anything from that. So <laughs> you're even more limited to, to, limited to information and, and what to expect in these um, situations. Um, and if you Google vulva, often the images that you come across are these porn images, and you think that, oh my gosh, I'm abnormal. So there's a really cool website called labia library, I think, .org, and they've got pictures of vulvas and you might have seen 
quite a few of them on that same episode. They kind of flashed these images of Wolves and how they all looked. At- okay, cool. So I was, yeah, I was yeah. just saying, I was just saying, this was a very interesting podcast for me. I loved it. Thank you very much. I hope you learned. I hope you learned some stuff. <laughs> Absolutely, man. And this is things that, listen, even like for me talking about these things, saying the words, something like even like I feel I shouldn't say it, but these are normal things, yeah. man. It should be normal. So more people should do yeah. what we do and more people should have Instagram yeah. accounts like yours. So people should definitely go and look at it. It's normal stuff, but society has kind of taught us a certain way and you can't say those words, but come on, man. It's just normal. It's normal anatomy. Exactly. You're more than comfortable to say ear, nose and mouth. So you should be yeah. comfortable to, to say vulva and labia and clitoris, et cetera. Yeah. And just like we, we know what works for us with regards to diet, with, with, with regards to exercise, with products to put in our faces. So we should be so in tune with what's happening with our, with our female genitalia and, you know, what works for us. You know, this lube is fantastic. This lube sucks for me. You know, this, um, this type of material irritates my vulva. This type of material is fantastic. It's more breathable. You know, having that awareness or even when it goes to tampons and menstrual products, you know, this is fantastic. This causes, this causes thrush. This doesn't, I'm going to use that. And, but we, we, we are so scared to talk about it and we, we almost have this disconnect from our, from our waist down. And we, mm. we don't actually identify with, with problems or what, what works for us and what doesn't. So mm. Yeah, it all, it all stems down to a lack of education and exposure and the taboo that is just so heavily ingrained in, in mm. so many different aspects of our lives. But it's fantastic to see it changing. It really, really yeah. is. No, yeah. Well done. Well done. Uh, I, love, I love your Instagram account. It's very... Thank you. And uh, thank you for talking to me. And we'll be in touch again another time. We'll, we'll chat again. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. I'm looking forward to it. Right. I'm sure you've got a lot. I'm sure you've got a lot to think about after that. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> okay. Thanks awesome. a lot. Lucky to okay. chat. Thanks so much, AJ. Have a good yes. evening. Bye-bye.